a sacrifice of praise. That's what this morning has been already, and I pray that it would just continue, Lord. That as we continue to worship you in the word, we would, we would fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the word. Lord, as we look at a life that was given completely for you, I pray that it would spur us on to give our lives the spiritual sacrifice of worship as just an overflow of what you have done, what you are doing, and what you will do. Lord, I pray that you would help each of us to finish the race well until you bring us home. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Please have a seat if you would. Grab your Bibles and find Matthew 14. We're actually in a new chapter in Matthew. I know it's kind of exciting, at least for me. I know you guys probably don't even pay attention or remember where we were last time, but I do. But um, to get us started, I want to sort of set the tone um, and tell you a little bit of a story about a ref- some of the reformers of our faith. So there was this man named Thomas Cranmer. He was a Protestant in England during the time of the Reformation. He was a theologian. He, he did a lot to, to get the, like the, the evangelical church out of Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, and into what we think of as Protestantism. So he was um, like people like Martin Luther, obviously John Calvin. Um, this was a man who lived in England, and he lived during the time of Henry VIII. Well, Henry VIII gave way to Queen Mary. Anybody know what Queen Mary's nickname was? Bloody Mary, not just a drink, right? It was Bloody Mary because because she was staunchly Catholic. And her goal was to get all of the Protestant bishops in England to renounce Protestantism and to, um, to commit their allegiance to the Catholic Church. And if they didn't, it was to the point of death. And for several years, Thomas Cranmer stayed faithful. He stayed faithful to the Protestant religion and did not denounce it and did not join with Bloody Mary until one day he saw two of his best friends who were also Protestant theologians being burned alive at the stake. And their names were Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. And they also are an amazing story. In fact, as these two who were holding to to the five solas, Right, this idea of by you know by grace alone through faith alone and Christ alone to the um for to by, according to the scripture alone by the glory of God alone that's what we're going to hold to to the point of death. So they're marched out, they're tied to a stake together, and 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 as the story goes by by church historians, um, it was um Ridley's the wood under Ridley's feet was um green, so it did not burn very fast. Where, um, where the, uh, Latimer's wood was dry and started to burn quickly. So all that to say, he's going to die much faster. And as he's getting ready to die, and he hears his friends starting to weaken under just the torture of, like, smoldering, which we can't even imagine, right? He says this to him, Play the man, Master Ridley. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England is I trust it shall never be put out. He's saying if we hold fast to what we know to be true, people will be speaking of our faith throughout history. And here we are 500 years later and we're still talking about it. So now back to our friend, um, uh, to, to our friend Mr. Landmer. Like what, what, what happened to him? Well, he sees these, his friends being burned alive and he weakens. It's hard to even blame him, Right? Like, I mean, you see, this is what's going to happen to you tomorrow. If you, so he recounts, and he signs some documents that basically say, I'm no longer holding to the, to the, to the Reformation theology. I'm no longer holding to um, the five solas. I am now going to hold to, I'm going I'm to agree with the Roman Catholic Church to save himself. And they start putting him in front of crowds to try to convince the masses that Catholicism is the way to go. So they've got, him up, they've got him on a speaking tour. And at one of those speaking tours, he gets his courage back. The Holy Spirit somehow, like, I'm sure works, um, like, like in, um, challenges him, encourages him, strengthens him. And instead of giving the talking points that they tell him to say to the crowd, he says this. And now I come to the great thing 
which so much troubleth my conscience, more than anything that I ever did or said in my whole life, and that is the setting abroad of a writing contrary to the truth, which now here I renounce and refuse as things written by my hand contrary to the truth which I thought in my heart. So here's what he's saying. The, the thing I regret most in my life is going against what I knew to be true about God and his word. And he, and he says, I wrote with my hand, but I did not believe it in my heart or in my mind. And so then he goes on to say this. I wrote this because I was in fear of death and wished to save my life. However, it was my hand that offendeth, writing contrary to my heart. Therefore, my hand shall be first to be punished. When I come to the fire, it shall be the first to burn. Now, what's he saying? He's saying that ultimately he is going to stand for the truth in his heart and in his mind by denouncing his flesh. And Fox's Book of the Martyrs actually records his death as saying when they tied him to the stake, he actually, and, and they lit the fire, he actually stuck his hand into his right hand into the fire to demonstrate to the people that, that what I wrote really was wrong. And I regret it. Now, now okay, so, so what? Like, what does that have to do with anything? Well, here's what it has to do with, guys. Like, do, do we understand that contrary to the prosperity gospel, that contrary to, frankly, the easy believism that has been the Christian church in America for 250 years, frankly, because we have been like, like no other people on the planet ever, we have been blessed to live in a country that does not persecute Christians. Um, have we, like, well, we'll get there in a minute. Like, do we, we understand that ultimately the church has always grown on the blood of the saints, Right, like, like that, that's, that is how the church has spread. Abby, during the gospel, almost shares a picture of where Paul was standing. Well, what happened to Paul? He was taken to Rome and beheaded. What happened to Peter? He was crucified upside down. Like, do we understand that ultimately the call to Christ may not for us be literally to die, but, it sh but, it, but in some ways, could be much harder because it should last much longer. Right? Getting burned alive at the stake would not be a great, would not be a very pleasant experience, but at least the suffering would be quick. Our question is: what are we willing? And I loved where Karis took us in this, like, like, what are we willing to let go of in our sacrifice of praise? Like, what, what, what are we willing to, to, to hold on to in the truth? To stay anchored to the rock that is Jesus. Right? We're going to see, we're, we're in this time where we're, where we're going to transition from, from Matthew chapters 11 through 13, and 13, which was really very much about this, like the rejection of Christ. The rejection from the people, the rejection from the religious leaders, from the government officials, from his own family. And then we're going to start to transition into this time where Jesus is going to show his disciples the mission. Here's what living missionally looks like, and here's the power of my kingdom coming. And that's what we're going to see in the second half, from really starting next week with the feeding of the 5,000 and him walking on the water and all these scenes of, of him going, this is what it looks like to take my message forward. But, but in the meantime, we're, we're last week and this week, we're in these two kind of odd scenes that frankly a lot of the commentators that I've read as I've been, as I've been preparing this, this um, sermon, the series on Matthew, they, they almost skip over what we talked about last week about his family rejecting him in Nazareth and what we're going to talk about this week in the death of John the Baptist. It's like, it's like these were just put here to show us that, that, that the rejection of Christ was complete. True. But I feel like in our current cultural moment, where for the first time ever in our 250 years of history as Americans, we are actually, it's, persecuted is way too strong a word. But it's actually not culturally favorable to call yourself a Christian anymore. That was never true in our country's history. Like, like part of why, how we, you know how part of how we came up with this whole cultural Christianity thing in America? Is because if you wanted to do business as an American in our early history, and frankly, right up until the 70s and 80s, you especially if you were in the South, 
like, you know, and, and, and probably might still be true in some areas of the South today, but I doubt it. You, you wanted to be known as a Christian because then Christians would do business with you. That's part of how this, so people would say, well, of course I'm a Christian. One, I'm an American, and two, it opens up this avenue of success for me. But that's not what Christianity is doing. That's, not, that's certainly not what the Reformers would have said. That's not what the Apostles would have said. Like, all of the Apostles died badly. And, and yet, for us, we are, maybe in some good ways, we're finally getting to a place as Americans where we go, are we really ready to put our praise where our mouth is, to put our sacrifice of praise where our mouth is? Are we, are we going to just say that we're Christians but hide it so that we don't get persecuted? Are we going to start to denounce him altogether? Right? Is, is it, it's just flat easier not to, frankly. Like just, it, 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 and and that's, that's ultimately why I felt compelled for us to, to spend some time last week and this week where a lot of the people have skipped over because I feel like it is really relevant to what we're, gonna, what we're experiencing today as Christians, where it is no longer, like, like, like I think years ago, I would, if I had to preach this message, it would have been like, yeah, but, but why are you telling me this? It's not, we're, we're not struggling here in America to be Christians. We're struggling now. So here's, my, here's a question that I have for you, just whether it's from persecution or just physical ailments or et cetera, our first talking points question. I just want you to raise your hand. How many of you have been through seasons of struggle since you've been saved? If you've been through a season of struggle since you've been saved, hold up your hand. Keep it up. How many, look around. Jesse, why is your hand not up? Get your hand. I, I know you, man. This was last week. Come on, man. Right? Like, look around. Like, we're in good company. So part of what we need to do is we need to get better at sharing our, our sort of our struggling stories. We were having dinner with a couple last night. We were talking about how, like, like that's part of what we do is just kind of go, yeah, we're fine. We're fine. We're fine. We're fine. Um, some of it's just a time thing. Some of it's just a, frankly, we don't care that much. Um, some of it is because we feel like then we have to share every detail and we have to ask about every detail instead of just kind of going, hey, life is hard right now. Can you just pray? And then let's just pray. All right? God knows the details. But, but, but we all, but, but some of it is, I think some of the reason we don't share our struggles and we go, oh, let me put on a happy face, is, is we've, we have been convinced that we're the only Christians that struggle. Well, wait a minute, if you're supposed to be, you know, this Christian and fruit, uh, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kind of like, like where's struggle, hardship, suffering, wah wah ism? Like, where is that? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with something that, that, that has happened in my life, and, I, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm frankly just fighting being angry at God about it. Some of what Karis and Mark were sharing during our prayer time, and, 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 and to be able to go, where, where, why don't we bring that stuff to each other? Because we're so good at kind of, like, the enemy is so good at kind of hiding us, like, from, like, hiding the real us. Sometimes even from us and, and over medication and all the things we even talked about last week. But um, so, what has gotten you through some of those seasons? So, what has gotten you through some of those seasons where you've been going through struggles? Just quickly, I'm asking. Okay, replacing lies with truths. And we're going to come back to that one here um, as part of the message today because that's part of what we're going to see happen is a whole lot of lies and a little bit of truth that can go a long way. Good. What else? Fellowship of the saints. It's just coming together, man. Like, like guys, I, like again this morning, I was moved to tears just in hearing your voices as you're singing. I'm like, man, like my soul needs to be reminded that I'm not nuts, right? That we're not alone in this. That like there are people that, that, are, that, are, that are desiring to set aside the distractions of this world and, and praise Jesus because he's worth it. Any others? Keep pressing Just keep pressing forward. Yeah, forgetting what lies behind. Paul in Philippians chapter 3. Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on. Like Paul writes that as he's imprisoned. This is towards the end of his life. And he's going, I'm, my, my fight is still press forward, press forward, press forward. Right? Like we, sooner or later, we have to just trust that Jesus has dealt with our past and move on, right, in the victory that he has assured us. So like I said, we're in this, series, we're in this season of transitioning from this time of, of Jesus' rejection, like the rejection of Christ, 
um, to this time of Jesus is going to show us his mission. And he wants to show us, like, what, is it, what does it look like to really be faithful, like, to the utmost? And so and when, I say, when I say he, I'm saying Matthew. So Matthew inserts this scene that is about John the Baptist. So, the, so today's message is called faithful to the end, or faithful, like, I would call it like faithful to the utmost, or faithful unto death. Like being able, like giving everything you have for the sake of the gospel. And that's ultimately what we're going to see is this, is this scene. He's going to insert a scene that happened earlier in time. It doesn't happen at this period of time. He's going to insert the scene of John's life because John was a forerunner. He was Jesus' earthly cousin, a forerunner of Christ. He was the one who came to prepare the way for the Lord. He was the one that started his ministry with, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus did the same thing when he started. He's the one who said things like, he must increase but I must decrease, and we're going to see this scene of, like, this is decrease at the massive, at the, at the, at the final level of decrease, which is decrease to the point of death. And so he's, got, so he's going to show us what I love how Warren Wiersbe says it this way. John the Baptist was a living beatitude. You remember the beatitudes? Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart. He says, he was poor in spirit, he was meek. He was merciful, he was pure in heart, and he mourned over the sins of God's people. He brought the message of peace and reconciliation with God for those who repent. He hungered and thirsted for righteousness. He was persecuted for righteousness' sake. He died for standing on the truth. And, and ultimately, what Matthew's trying to show us is, but he's like, before we launch into, here's what the mission looks like, are you really ready for this? Are you really ready to be forsaken by all and persecuted by many? Like that's ultimately the point he's trying to make here. So the question becomes for us today is when life gets hard, how are you going to remain faithful? When life gets hard, how are you going to remain faithful? And we're looking at the first, um, I probably should turn there. We're looking at the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 14. And we're going to talk about how, um, the, well, how do we do that? Well, we don't create a false narrative. Like, we don't create stories. We're going to see that in a minute. Um, we don't get callous. Don't let your heart get hard by, by all the sin and, and brokenness of the world. And the last thing is we don't carry our burdens alone. So we're going, to, we're going to learn these truths, some through the life of John the Baptist and his disciples, but mostly through looking at the one who killed him. So, John is, or so Matthew's going to show us a little bit about what made Herod, Herod. And so we're going we're gonna to learn some lessons from a madman on what not to do. So what, when, when life gets hard, how do you remain faithful? The first thing you do is you don't create a false narrative. So what does that mean? What does a false narrative mean? Well, let's look at um, the first couple of verses of, John, or of Matthew 14. He says, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch, heard about the fame of Jesus. Now, this is not Herod the Great. Herod the Great is the one that had the babies killed in Bethlehem. This is Her one of Herod's sons. When Herod died, his kingdom was divided, or, or his control of that part of the Roman kingdom was divided into four parts. That's why he's called the Tetrarch. It just means four. So this is one of them. This is, um, this is Herod Antipas. He is the one that is, that is alive during the crucifixion of Christ. So, he's, so he is there, and he says... Um, so, so this is, so he says, so, so Herod, um, so Herod, the Tetrarch, the one who ruled a quarter of the kingdom that Jesus lived in, about the heard about the fame of Jesus. And look at what he says. He said to his servants, this is John the Baptist who has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. Now, now he is... Like I said, we're going to see in a minute, Matthew's going to take us back in time to a scene where, where Herod has um, John the Baptist killed. So when he says he's been raised from the dead, here's, all, here's what Herod is saying. He's saying, my ghosts have come back to haunt me. Like, like this is crazy. Like, like literally he thinks that Jesus is somehow the reincarnated, reincarnated version of John the Baptist because in his mind, he knows that he wrongly had John the Baptist killed. And so he's living in guilt, he's living in shame, and he is massively insecure. And he was even before he had John the Baptist killed, and we'll see a little bit of that here in a minute. But, but I want, that, that's what I mean by, how, like, how does, the, how does the person who's in control of a quarter of the kingdom get his brain to actually thinking 
that, that this Jesus person that I'm hearing tell about, that I would love to meet, Luke tells us that in Luke chapter 3, how, how, is it, how do I actually convince myself that he is, he is the one I killed, murdered, he is him reincarn reincarnated? How does that happen? Here's how it happens. He's telling himself a story. What he's doing is he's saying that from the time, when, however long it was from the time that he actually had John executed till now, he has been telling himself a story. And it hasn't been a good one. And all it takes is for somebody to push a button and that story springs back up. Now here's why that matters. This is what I mean by don't tell yourself like a false, don't, don't, don't live in a false narrative. Guys, we are all telling ourselves stories all the time. Guys, you are, like, the, the reason the Bible is told in story is because story, now I don't mean, not story like fable, story like it's a narrative account of human history, and not just a list of rules and do's and don'ts, and, and, and the way to live your life better, and, and, and those kinds of things. The reason it's told the way it is, like, all, all of the Old Testament history is a story about Christ, for sure, but the reason it's told in story is because story is powerful, Story is what like motivates, animates our lives for good and for bad. And we're constantly telling ourselves some story. And here's the other thing. We're telling each other some story about ourselves and about other people. It's, that's always been true. Do you not, if you don't believe it, think about Cain and Abel. Like all the way, so Adam and Eve, they sin. They, they told themselves a massive stupid story. They, buy, they, they, they fall. They, they rebel. Now think about their first kids. What, how, why does Cain kill Abel? Because he's telling himself a story about his brother. Man, that punk, he's just, a, he, everything he does is always better. And I'm, you know, blah, 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 and I'm just, and God even warns him. He says, man, Cain, watch out. Like, like evil is lurking and it wants to destroy you. But he is, Cain is so consumed in his story, he doesn't care. All I want is revenge, and he kills his brother. And God's like, is it, is it your brother's blood cries out to me? And he's like, yeah, it's not my problem. He, I'm not his keeper. All of it was because, he was tell, because Cain was telling himself a story that wasn't true about his brother. That somehow God loved him more. Because okay, so that's not enough for you. How about Abraham. You know, we're going to pray tonight. We have a prayer night tonight right here at 6 o'clock. And one of the things we're going to pray about is what's going on in the Middle East. Do you know why what's going on in the Middle East is going on in the Middle East? Because Ishmael. Because Abraham and Sarah started telling themselves a story. God made a promise. You, from you, all the descendants of the world will be blessed. From your seed. And, you know, in fairness, 25 years is a long time to wait for a promise. But they start telling themselves a story. Man, maybe God needs our help. And, and what we see happening 4,000 years later in that part of the world is because they were telling themselves a story. Because how about David? David, the man after God's own heart. Probably the closest thing you get to of a Christ figure in the Old Testament. But he learns that while, he's, while the story is really hard. He's being chased by a madman. Like, this is his reality. He's not telling himself a lie. He gets on the throne, and he gets fat, dumb, and happy. And all of a sudden, his story changes. And you know what his story changed to? 2 Samuel chapter 11. In the year, in the season, when kings go out to fight, David stayed home. And the rest is history. Bathsheba, baby dies. Because that's not just the end of that part of the story. Like, his whole family was a train wreck from then on. Why? Because he told himself a story. Man, I deserve to sit this one out. I've put up with years of chase, being rate chased. I've, I've done so, like, I, it's not a big deal. I'm just going to sit this one out. I'm not going to do what God's called me to do, what God's wired me to do, what God's made me do. That's the story he should have been living in. But he's like, no, I, the story I'm going to tell myself is I deserve this. And it destroyed his life. Like, literally, Destroyed his life for the rest of his life. Guys, here's the thing. You are telling yourself a story. Other people are telling you a story. And, and we're telling stories about one another. All the time. We are, we are a bunch of canes. 
looking at a bunch of Abel's going, oh, well, the reason they behave, the reason those people behave this way is because of this or that or because they believe this or they don't, or they don't, um, or they don't know that or, or they don't look like me or they don't vote like me or they don't act like me or they don't, whatever it, like, whatever it is. We tell that story about our spouses. We tell that story about our brothers and sisters. We tell that story. We tell, we tell stories to ourselves about other people in our heads all the time. And, guys, here's why it matters. Because the story you're telling yourself now is impacting your future. Like, the voice in your head that you're telling yourself is, I'm, I'm, I'm not, we're not a name it and claim it. I'm not saying that. We're not self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that just because I think it, it's going to happen. But there is a part of it when we go, what we expect to happen sometimes happens because we subconsciously make it happen. If I've been telling a story about how Eli is my enemy, I'm picking him because he's just such a sweet kid, right? I mean, he's not a kid, but you know what I mean. So I'm picking him. Plus, he's wearing a flower shirt, so he's easy to pick out. <laughs> so I tell a story, and, I'm, and over and over I'm telling the story about Eli being my enemy. When Eli comes up to me at church on Sunday, he's like, hey, how you doing today? What is my countenance going to be towards him? Cold? Aloof? At best, a little bit like Hey, jerk, get away from me, right? What's that ultimately going to make him? My enemy. Like, he's going to go, man, Doug does not like me. Doug's got a problem with me. I need to stay away from Doug. My story impacted him and affected my future. That's the reality. So the question starts to become, what story are we living in? Herod was living in a completely messed up story because he was a completely messed up dude. And so rather than see Jesus for who he is, he starts making up some completely whacked out theology. Reincarnated? To come and, and, and somehow like, like mess with me? As that's just how powerful story is. So what's the solution? Here's the solution. We got to tell ourselves the true story. We got to tell ourselves the gospel story. We got to tell that story when we start thinking when we start thinking things about ourselves. We got to start tell we got to filter that story we're telling to ourselves about ourselves through the gospel. That yes, I did do that and that's why Christ died and I am victorious because he overcame. And and when we start hearing that little whisper of a story about other people, we got to start rather than go, "Oh yeah, oh yeah." Let me find some more things on YouTube about, about how bad that person is. Or let me, let me do some more research about how bad that people group is. And, and like, instead, we got to go, hey, the, the gospel story is those people, whoever that, those people or that person is, whether it be your spouse or your favorite celebrity pastor that just hit the dirt, like, which, whichever one it is, those people are image bearers of the Almighty. That's the gospel story. Those are people that are in need of grace, just like you just like me. So rather than telling a story that is going to harden you, which will bring us to our second point here in a minute, find a story or tell the story that is the gospel story. And that, guys, I'm telling you, that is so hard for me. I love telling myself a good story that gets my flesh all worked up. It, I, it just feels better. Why? Because I'm broken, man, and so are you. So find, a, find ways to tell yourself a better story. That brings us to our second talking points question. Why does it seem like to be so, um, so much a part of the human condition to discount who Jesus is? So if, if part of why we're not telling ourselves the right story is for, for the same reason, let's say that Herod is, is because we're trying to redefine Christ, why is that such a huge part of the human story? Throughout history. That's the biggie, right? We all love ourselves a little above ourselves. We all want to be our own kings. We all want to take God off of the throne of our heart so that we can put ourselves on it. That has been the human story. What else? Makes our sins not as bad. Like we feel like, you know, at least I'm better than those people. What else? What? Yeah, we're leaky people. You know, we, we leave here and we go, yeah, you know what, that man, that was really, con ouch. Uh. And within hours, we've forgotten and we're fighting back with our spouses again. Because it's your fault that this, and because it's that, and that, and that, you know, it's like all, it's like all the things. It's because we just, we leak and the world loves to overwhelm us. And oh, by the way, because our flesh, our, our not yet restored flesh, 
is part of this brokenness, it likes to be fed that way. Like the world is like miracle grow for your flesh. Right? And so we got to find ways to like, no, no, no. Is my, and, and, and all the things we talked about in our first talking points of like be around God's people, um, replace the lies with the truth, et cetera, et cetera. Because that brings us to our, because if we don't do that, if we just keep telling ourselves the wrong story, that brings us to our second point. We will get very calloused of heart. Like our hearts will grow hard towards individuals, towards people groups, sometimes towards ourselves, and, and oft, often towards God. We will get calloused of heart. So don't grow callous. Like this, there's this hard-heartedness. Like, it, guys, it is so easy for us to justify what we do and how we treat other people. I mean, just think about how easy it is to justify how we're, and I'm not going to go back to last week's message about politics, but think about, like, just because something is politically expedient, think about the things that Christians have put up with in the last decade. To marry, yeah, exactly, to marry ourselves to politics that is wholly ungodly and call it gospel truth. Because it just is expedient to do so. If that fire, just go back and listen to last week's message. We're not going there again. But now what's going to happen is we're going, is we're going back in time. So, so look at verse 3. It says, for, so that's, that's, how we, that's part of how we know. So we're like, okay, so, so, so Herod is freaking out. He's come back to haunt me. And then Matthew's going to give us the backstory about how, that's even a, how could that even be a thing. It says, for Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Uh, we, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this section because it's just dark and it, it, make, it makes your mind go to bad places. So just, I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But guys, here's the thing. When, when Herod the Great died, sons, get, get part of the kingdom. The, one of the other brothers was Herod, was Philip. Philip was married to Herodias. Um, this Herod, Herod Antipas, was married to an Arab princess. He divorces his wife, not good, and then steals his brother's wife. That's Herodias. Also not good. John says, because John went to them, verse 4, and said, it is not lawful for you to have her. He goes to the ruler, the king, and he says, you are living in sin. And he was. Like openly, dark sin. Which, oh, by the way, didn't end well for Herod. And maybe we'll get there at the end. I don't know. It's not really the point of the story. But, but watch it, how hard-hearted, though. Ra- rather, than, rather than at the very least, when Nathan comes to David, David does say, against God I have sinned. And he writes psalms like Psalm 32 and Psalm 51 and these, and these psalms of repentance. It doesn't change the train wreck his life is from then on. But it does show, it does show his, at least his heart soften in the moment. Herod doesn't do that. Herod immediately is like, well, I'm, I'm going to ignore you. You're the problem, so I'm going to arrest you. So it says, and though he wanted, he didn't just want to arrest John, verse 5. He wanted to put him to death, because, but he feared the people because the people liked John. John was really popular. He was like the celebrity pastor before there were celebrity pastors. And then it says in verse 6, but when Herod's birthday came... The daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod. Now, like, let me just say this. This is not some sweet little girl in her ballerina outfit dancing for them. This is probably a middle teen young lady, because they were getting married at like 13 and 14 at that age, who is completely inappropriately dancing in front of a group of men by her mother's request. This is a dark court. Like, it, it, is, it, is as, it is as foul as anything going on on the internet today. And there's some junk on the internet. Verse 7. So he promised, like it was so apparently whatever, he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. What a weak, weak man. But, th- but that didn't happen overnight. His heart got harder and harder and more and more callous. And then it says, and prompted by her mother. Get this. Okay, so some of you don't have perfect moms. Right? None of us have perfect moms. I'm pretty confident none of our moms did this to our heads. Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. He, she goes to her daughter and says, when he, at, when he says, I'll give you whatever you want, say you want, 
you want the one who has embarrassed me publicly? That's, mom's mad. Mom's fired up at John because John's embarrassed her publicly oh, multiple times. And he, so she goes to her daughter and says, tell your stepdad, your uncle, your, yeah, train wreck family, that you want that guy's head on a platter. You talk about past trauma, right? Trauma is the word, you know, the way trauma, like we have to deal with our trauma and our parents are, you know, we all, you know my, goal, my goal as a parent has always been to make my, parent, my, my children go through counseling, right? And now that my, my, my wife is a counselor, I feel like it's a win-win because they'll pay her. And I get to, no, just kidding. Um, but, but, like, think about the past trauma, like, that, like this poor girl is going through. Because, just because, like, how dark does it have to get? And then it says, it actually says, he regrets doing it. It says in verse 9, and the king was sorry because of his oath and his guests, but his guests, um, and his guests he had commanded it to be given. So he's saying, because he's so afraid of what other people think. He's so insecure. He's living in so much shame. He can't go, I was just, no, we're not doing that. He's king. He could have, but he won't. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison. Immediately. Immediately it happens. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl. And she brought it to her mother. Man, like, like seriously, how dark do we have to be? Like, how hard does our heart have to get? But guys, what David just makes a decision. I'm going to sit this one out. I'm going to stay home. That leads to seeing Bathsheba committing adultery. That leads to murdering her husband. That leads to actually telling one of his, putting one of his generals in a compromising position. That leads to one of his generals then constantly blackmailing David for the rest of his life. That leads to one of David's other children raping another one of David's children, which then another one of David's children kills the one who raped the one, and so on and so on and so on. And, and here's the part about this. David, David's heart, a, a man after God's own heart, his heart had gotten so calloused, he did nothing about it. Nothing. Joab's blackmailing him. He does nothing. Absalom's begging him to do something. He does nothing. Because his heart just got that hard. His heart got that calloused. He's like, I'm going to put it off. I'm gonna, not, not this hard, but that hard. Like, it's, it's just how dark we can get. Proverbs 6 says this. Write this verse refer, reference down. Six, Proverbs 6, 6 9 through 19, 16 through 19 says, There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to do evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Man, Herod is guilty of all of those things. But before we, compl- we, before we finish, like just lay the axe on him and go, man, Herod is the worst human being that's ever lived. There, but for the grace of God, goes I. Right? None of us are beyond that. The minute we say, I could never, we're, we're well on the way to getting there. I've seen that in my own life. I've seen it in the lives of people I've discipled over and over. We, we have got to constantly remember who we are, how it's so easy to become callous towards the things of sin. Like the, and the enemy never says, Doug, go from one to, what, like to, to murdering your brother who's annoying you. What he does do is he says, start small. Just be a little annoyed. And then it's, well, well now, like, confront him and have some, like, some conflict. Like, like you're, now you're actually at physical odds with each other. And then it's like, and as we're moving down that road, that, old, that end game, not, not actual murder, but that end game of going, you're dead to me, you're out of my life, is not that big a stretch. That's how the enemy works. One step at a time, callousing our heart. That's why, last talking points question, the company we keep matters so much. That's why the company we keep matters so much. So I'll just answer the question for you. Why? Because it reminds us of what is true and right and lovely and pure. If there's anything excellent and anything worthy of praise, dwell on those things, Philippians 4.8. Right? Like we've got, we've got to be renewing, and, and, and we can, certainly our time in the Word, certainly our time in prayer, certainly, but, but guys, being, being around people, this is why Karen and I were having a conversation on Friday just about how, like, the, one of the scary things about seeing so many people, like, moving away from real relating, real relationships, going to church, coming to prayer night, going to whatever it is, like, just being involved in other people's lives, like, in a real way. 
out, like especially among people that they don't have, like it's not, it's not just their own little select people group is what I mean. Like we're, there's so few, there's so little of that going on. Be, one of the biggest dangers in that is that is the, that kind of relating, the kind of relating that we don't have com- control over. Like in other words, if, if Jesse and Corey start getting annoying to me and I feel the freedom to go, you know what, I, I can just move away from that relationship. It's no big deal. Then the Lord has, then I'm missing out on whatever it is the Lord is trying to use them to do in my life to conform me into the image of Jesus. But what we've done is we've moved away from so many of those relationships in our lives, and, 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 and we're either out of relationship altogether because it's all virtual or through devices or whatever, or it's only in select groups that we have control over so that when they do start, so that we can kind of pick and choose the least annoying piece of people possible. All that to say this, what's the big deal? Here's the big deal. What tool is God going to use to make us look like Jesus? If relationship is how it's done, like hard relationships, like difficult relationships, and we, and we extricate ourselves from all of those because it's comfortable, and it is. You, I annoy you. You annoy me. It's part of the deal. Praise God. But when we, thank you, sister, but when, <laughs> but when you get... But when you get, but guys, but when we, when we remove ourselves from that, then we start to wonder, like, why am I not growing spiritually? I'll let you in a little secret. It's because you're not in relationships with people that annoy you, right? You can, I mean, you can listen to all the best, you can listen to the, you can listen to Bible teachers that are infinitely better than me on YouTube, and it will do far less for your soul than showing up on a Sunday and, and having to relate to people before and after church. Right? That's where we put it really to practice. So here's our last point, and it goes quickly because it's one verse. So when life gets hard, how do we remain faithful? One, we, we got to stop telling ourselves lies and false stories. Right? Two, we got to we got to really guard against becoming callous. And the last thing is we don't carry our burden alone. So look at verse 12 of chapter, of chapter 14. It says, And his disciples came and took the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. I love how Spurgeon says this about that, that one verse. His commentary on that verse was this. It is important to notice that it doesn't say they buried John, but John's body. It says the real John was not there. The real John had gone on to greater reward. Now, why does that matter? You say, okay, uh, duh. Obviously, we're Christians. We believe that. But, guys, we got to hold on to that. Like, that's the hope we got to hold on to. Because if, if what we think is, oh no, poor John got beheaded, that changes the story we're telling about God's story. If what we say is, praise the Lord, John was, was released from captivity. Like one, in prison physically, but even in prison, like in, in his own body. Like it was better for him to be beheaded. That changes the, the narrative in our brain completely. But we don't think of it that way. Why? Glad you asked. We're going to finish up here. We're done in Matthew. Turn to the right of where we are to Romans chapter 5. This is what we're going to use to go into our time of response. I love how John's disciples are faithful. They stick around. They take his body. This had to have been so hard for them. Like, like their, their teacher for several years is gone. They don't know what to do. They show up and his, all that's left is his body. No head. They take and, and yet... They go and they bury it. They give him a respectful burial. And then they go to Jesus. Like they take, they don't just go, man, what are we going to do now? And they run and hide. They do what we all need to do. They run to Christ and go, help. Right? Like like what do we do now? And that's where we're going to pick up the story. They're going to join Jesus' disciples and and keep going forward. But but why is that? Like why do we run to Christ? Because the same reason Paul did. The same reason Peter did. Because what Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. That was our opening video. Like, do we really believe that? Do we really go, man, I, like, when I'm feeling anxious, when I'm, when I'm hearing that false story, when my heart's getting hard towards those people, run to Jesus. Run to Jesus because he cares. So in Romans chapter 5, look at verses 3 and 4. It says, Not only that, we'll get to what that is in a minute, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And you're like, wait, what? That doesn't sound very much fun. 
We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. Why should we do that? Why, sh why should we rejoice in our suffering? Why should we even believe there's hope? Why should we believe what Charles Spurgeon said about John? That it, was, that it wasn't John, it was John's body they buried. Well, because of verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Right? The reason we can rejoice in our suffering is because we know that Christ has already done for us what needed to be done. Because through him we have obtained access to the faith in this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of his glory. Guys, do you get that? We rejoice in the hope of his glory. So, so, where, so, so when it says, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, why can, we believe, why, can we do, why can we live that way as Christians? When things are getting hard, when, when life circumstances are getting tough, how do we remain faithful? By knowing that our hope is set in the heavenlies. That it's already been accomplished. Turn to the right where we are a couple more pages to, to Matthew chapter 8. I'm sorry, to Romans chapter 8. In verse 31. This is the argument Paul is elaborating on. He's pulling the, the Romans 5 argument forward. He's saying, our hope is set in the heavenlies because Christ has come to bring peace between us and God. There's nothing that can be done to undo that. That's what he's going to tell us right here. And we're just going to, I'm going to read this and we're going to go into our time of, of response. He says in verse 31 of chapter 8 of Romans, it says, when they, what then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, if he has brought us peace, who can be against us? And man, if he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how much more will he give us all things? He's like, this is so much better than just salvation. Like, like I, I'm saying that on purpose. What Christ has given us is better than just salvation. And that's a pretty big just. Like, that's a massive eternity difference kind of just. And he's telling us, so who can condemn us? More than that, who is raised? Who is at the, he's at the, if, if, Christ has been, if Christ died for us, then we're going to be raised. Verse 35, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And then just to prove the point, he lists a whole bunch of stuff. Not distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or sword. He's like, verse 38, for I am sure, this is the hope. This is how, this is the answer to the question. When life gets hard, how do you remain faithful? Here's how. I am sure of this. That neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation, nothing, anywhere, ever, anytime can separate you from the love of Christ. Because it's about him. And so as you come forward to get your cup and go back to your seat, and, and I'll, I'll come back up and I'll lead us through um, like, like that, that victory that we have. I just want to encourage you to, to, to think about the fact that, that the reason we can persevere is because it's not about us. It's about him and, wh and who he is and what he's done. Let me pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for that truth. I thank you for the truth that, that our perseverance that produces character and character produces hope is because that hope is set in the heavenlies. And it's not just set there, but it's secured there by the blood of the cross. So as we come to your table now, I pray that you would remind us of that beautiful truth. That because of who you are and what you have done, when we come to faith in Christ, we are secure no matter what happens here. In Jesus' name, let us believe that. In Jesus' name, let us live like we believe that. And it's in that beautiful name we pray. Amen.